In order to understand the present, we must understand the past. And that past starts with Street Fighter 4. Or, or was it Super Street Fighter 4? Or was it Ultra? The, but whatever. In Street Fighter 4, I swore my allegiance to Kami as I fell in love with her the first time I ever seen her in a movie. Whether if I'm talking about this or Kylie Minogue, I'll leave it up to you. I didn't know any combos whatsoever. Yeah, fuck that. Even though I didn't have any combos, I had about four moves that I would keep in rotation. Cannon spikes when people would jump, spiral arrows when they would come towards me, lucky cannon strikes when I get over the occasional fireball, and supers for the occasional read. In other words, I was a filthy fucking casual. If you would ask me how I did these moves, it looked something like this. Looks the same, right? Yeah, felt the same too. All of this would change with the abrupt appearance of a fellow Kami player. This guy had the combos, this guy baited me, and he even revoked my degree from Counter Strike University as I had a master's in Wake Up DP. But it was only a matter of time before the most despicable, disgusting mic drop was going to happen with me as the audience. You're probably wondering, Alex, why would you do that? Cannon Spike go burr. Let's see that. An instant replay. As the respectable cami player I was, I took this loss as calmly as possible. You see, on the left, this is a regular dive kick. You see on the right, this is what this game shark using motherfucker. I said to myself, hey, if I learn how to do this move, I might become just as good as this guy. But being the pad player I was at the time proved to be too difficult due to my linguini hand dexterity. And then I would later try on a fight stick and that went, um. Uh... Although the salt from this situation did dissipate, I began to run into more and more players that would expose how limited my toolkit really was. Since I only relied on these four options I mentioned before, the fun turned into frustration what led to me quitting the game altogether after the release of Super Street Fighter 4. Until the announcement of a new Street Fighter in 2016, I had bought my first arcade stick, a laptop, and a copy of Street Fighter 5 with the intentions of finally digging my teeth into a fighting game. But due to its abysmal launch, I lost faith. I know I'm not the only one when it came to the failed launch of Street Fighter 5 that the possibilities of trying other fighting games became a new avenue. To give them credit, they did clean up things, but by the time they did, I just wasn't interested anymore. The interest didn't fade because I didn't like Street Fighter anymore. It was a mere conversation with a friend about the simple days of PlayStation 2 and the fighting game that sat beside my console throughout a large chunk of its lifespan. Tekken Tag Tournament. And out of curiosity to see where the Tekken series had went, they were already on their seventh iteration, which was due to release soon or had already released. And that friend I had the initial conversation with would be the same one that would tell me to get Tekken 7. Little would I know that Tekken 7 would become my most played game of recent memory, exposing me to the world of the fighting game culture and lead to the creation of this channel. Only problem was, I had always been trash at Tekken, only laying hands on it briefly in Tekken 6. And I got bodied then, so I guess things really haven't changed much now. Instead of looking at my less than novice starting point, I took it more of a challenge to see how it was possible for me to reach a validation point in fighting games. Cause damn, the universe knew I was yearning at the opportunity, leading Tekken 7 to be that game. As Tekken is a 3D fighter allowing you to move in the foreground and the background, unlike a traditional 2D fighter, I knew the road was going to be rough. Not even considering the difference in pacing and how each button pertains to a limb, unlike the usual light, medium, hard punch to prior experiences. Which by the way, the buttons are referred to one, two, three, and four. And I assume you would know what one plus two and three plus four would mean. This is for later reference because I do mention this later in the video. And you know other games use different annotations. There's plenty of videos out there where people do the what's up guys, it's your boy back at it again with another video. Today we're gonna do our top five reasons and why I got better at fighting games and why my journey got the way it is and blah, 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 blah. Which I notice is usually pros that talk about their pleb experience to their pro experience. And I kind of want to have somebody that's more relatable. And I never saw that, so this is why I want to make this video because I feel like there's a lot of people who struggle with fighting games and get caught in a rut and just feel like things are impossible and maybe this could be relatable if you're in the thought process that's the opposite of this title of this video. In this video I reflect on my previous experiences and kind of give you guys advice and ways to step away from the mistakes I made and that way it can make your fighting game process a little bit smoother. I also go over some key elements of fighting games just general ways of thinking but kind of coming from my perspective so it's not like a full-blown definition but you'll get it as we go through. Before I 
even get started, thanks to Riven Me This and Earthworm Ben in my Discord because my PC wasn't rendering anymore. I ended up finding out it was a RAM stick that was dying and a hard drive that died, unfortunately. If it wasn't without them, I would have been pushing this video back even more. So I appreciate you guys, all the Discord homies that sent me clips to use in this video. Thanks a lot. Mucho appreciates. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the video. I guess we should get familiar with the game that is Tekken 7. Welcome to the revolution. Hey, come on, come on. So loading Tekken 7 in the beginning wants something like no fucking tutorials, less interesting stages, this shit, that shit, how do I even fight stick? Okay, okay, let's just start by looking for a new character. I mean, there's possibly nothing reminiscent of a Street Fighter character. <laughs> Akuma's in this shit? Unfortunately, I knew my dragon punches and cortisoke motions joined the cult of fuck that. So naturally, I knew this wasn't gonna happen. Since Akuma was from Street Fighter and my beginning started from Street Fighter, the want to choose him was pretty strong. Thing is, I knew merging the world of this 3D space and the lack of ability to even play on a fight stick at this point probably wasn't gonna mix well. So instead of going into the world of the unknown, I decided to go with something that felt a little familiar, that being my old flame, Alyssa. Since I used to main her in Tekken 6 and I do like unique characters, which she is uh, pretty different from the cast. I have been programmed to destroy you. So naturally being the new player that I was, it was time to check out the move list and oh, uh, well. Oh, hell no. So how about them sample combos, am I right? These teach you the basic sequence of how a combo should be performed. First, you need a combo starter that will start your combo, like launchers, floor bounds that bounce you from the floor, and the snake edge. Oh fuck. That is a sweeping low among some others. But for this basic example, it's just started off with a launcher. From there, you have a small comma that leads into a screw attack, or as I like to call it, do a barrel roll state. Then you do a small string of moves or a single move that is your combo ender. Then you have something known as rage, where your health is at a certain level that opens you up to two special moves as well as an extra damage buff. One is a powerful combo starter or extension known as rage drive, and then you have a cinematic special move known as rage art, which is typically used as an ender. However, these options may vary between characters or how the player uses them. And Rage Arts do have a bit of invincibility. And now Rage Arts do have a bit of armor frames during their startup, which means if you hit them during their startup frames, it'll absorb the hit or a couple of hits in some cases. So beware if you're going to be attacking them during it, which totally won't come up later in the video. Congratulations, you just finished the scrub course that Tekken itself couldn't even provide. With the sample combos now being practiced, this is when all players learn the struggle of learning their first combo, especially when you start dropping it over. And over, and over, and over, and over. But when you finally land that combo on line. God damn, God damn. That's some good shit. I doubt anybody will argue about the euphoria that comes from landing their first combo online. But you wanna know what else feels good, especially online? Landing a counter hit and knowing what to do when it happens. What you doing, huh? Wait, what you doing? You jucking, you jiving? Yeah, you boom, just... motherfucker, counter oh, hit. Oh, shit. Well, looking back, sometimes the simplest of teachings can create the worst habits. Since this was my initial introduction on how to deal damage without the help of the internet, that is, was my only tools to get my offense started. So if you are or were like me, you probably encountered this as well, or we shared the same problem. I only consider the reward without considering the risk. The sample combos that caught my attention were of course the biggest damage dealers, like this one or this one or the one especially with the snake edge because no, you know, not everybody expects a low all the time. Another move I did like to use a lot was the rage arts because of the invincibility frames I mentioned a second ago. But when I would find myself in situations where I couldn't land these moves or get my offense started at all, these would easily become my panic moves and it would only get worse when it was blocked. Little did I know there was something at play that involved fighting games that I didn't even know of at the time and that thing was known as frame data. Now at the time I didn't know what frame data was and I wouldn't learn about it till way in the future to be clear. So let's go into what frame data is so you can use it now or later. In my opinion, frame data can be broken up into three things. First, we have neutral. It's when your character ain't doing shit, AKA a neutral state. Second one being startup frames. If you ever heard somebody say that's a 10 frame jab, what they actually mean is it takes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 frames to finish. And then we look at the final thing, recovery frames. This is the amount of frames it takes for you to return back to your neutral state, which you typically cannot block during your recovery frames. Using the 10 frame jab, it takes about 18 frames to finish. Up until now, Alyssa was only punching the wind. So what happens when a move is blocked? This triggers something known as blocking frames or being positive on block and being negative on block. Positive on block is when a character returns to the neutral state first and the negative is when the character returns to the neutral state last. I'll be using these boxes to help you understand what state 
states the character are in throughout this process. Neutral is going to be white, startup is going to be purple, positive is going to be blue, and negative is going to be red. So let's start. Neutral, startup, block, and now we race back to neutral. Looking at the frame data, Alyssa is plus one on block, which means she will return to a neutral state first, and since Fang is negative one on block, he will recover one frame after Alyssa. Though one frame might not sound like much, if Fang decides to jab right after this, Alyssa will land first because she is one frame ahead of Fang, even though both jabs have a 10 frame startup. <laughs> If you're still confused, just imagine a race track. The moment the jab is blocked, the race begins. With the finish line representing neutral, Alyssa will arrive to the finish line first because she has plus one on block. So no matter if Fang is negative 17, negative 10, or negative one, Fang will always finish last because he is negative on block. Now in every fighting game, there's a standard fastest move, which in Tekken's case, it's the 10 frame jab. This means anything more negative than negative 10, negative 12, negative 13, negative 14, etc., is punishable on block. If anything is less than negative 10, negative nine, negative eight, and then the positive frames means it's not punishable on block, also known as being safe on block. Now, if you're the defender that's dealing with all these safe moves, ducking, dashing, sidestepping, and just movement in general is gonna be at your disposal too so don't always worry about attacking. I can't go over everything, but this is my general idea. Alex, that's that's great. That's great. I really... Why do I give a fuck? All right, all right. So let's look at the combo starter I use pretty frequently, being back three plus four. All right, neutral, start up block and this time Fang is now positive on block and now he is fully recovered while Alyssa is still negative 17 on block and you know what that means you can't block during the recovery frames as long as Fang uses a move that's faster than 17 he is guaranteed that attack to round things out with the sense of attacking the counter hit state is when you hit them on the starter frames and a punish is when you hit them during the recovery frames or in simple terms a counter hit is when you get hit before you steal a cookie out of the cookie jar and a punish is when you get hit after you retrieve the cookie and as I showed earlier with the counter hit, the level of reward does vary between the move that you hit them with on counter hit. Spacing also plays a part because some of the moves may push you back enough where your usual punish doesn't reach. And finally, remember when Alyssa was punching the wind? Yare yare. The reason why I wanted to bring this up at all is because I wanted to help you understand maybe how or why you're putting yourself in these extremely unfavorable situations. This will hopefully alleviate you from wanting to blame the game because if you do a chunky ass move and you smash right after, will of course lead you on a path of punishment of varying degrees. Now, like I said, I didn't learn this at the time, but I did recognize the risk after getting punched in the face multiple times. Then one day I remembered something so mind blowing, so truthful to the existence of the world. The Pandora's box of the mystery was finally broken. I remembered that Tekken is a 3D fucking fighter. If I can't land these combo starters, maybe there's a way to use movement to create an opening. Then one day in a match, I accidentally, I mean, we're just gonna pretend that wasn't Megatron, right? No, I'm, I'm just kidding. I know that was a Zoid. I sidestepped on purpose, evading attack to deal a launcher of my own. I came to realize Tekken, or I guess fighting games in general, wasn't about waiting for your turn the whole time, but how movement can create an opening that wasn't there before. And the whole idea of movement, especially in Tekken, was about to get turned up to 100, as I noticed something pretty weird the more I played. I began to notice these players doing these janky, jittery, backdash looking things that seemed to make movement more seamless. So I decided to go on the interwebs and find out what the hell this thing was. And through my findings, I found something known as Korean backdashing, or KBD, which is a backdash cancel for Tekken. With my confidence building playing on a fight stick, I seen this as a worthy challenge, or at least something of my time to get comfortable with Tekken in general, especially when it was going to prove an area where I felt like I was really lacking. Seeing fluid movement in Tekken kind of blew my mind since I thought the movement was so damn slow throughout the series. Thus may explain my need to go full on bullshit blazing rushdown because all I wanted to do was go forward. So when I encountered players that can do this Korean backdashing stuff constantly moving away from me, I had no idea how to approach or even defend or even just what to just run. A quick search into how to deal with situations like these no matter what game you play will lead you to one of the biggest buzzwords in fighting games, simply known as footsies. In most modern fighting games, you start in a position where neither character has a direct advantage. I didn't say all of them. Footsies are basically the tug of war of this neutral space to push the flow in the match in either player's favor. With little room to work with, combo starters may be too punishing at a range like this, so short, medium, and long range pokes are more suitable at least to control the pace until an opening appears or is created. Footsies are primarily made up of four elements, with punishing, pokes, baiting, also known as fainting, and movement, of course. Whip punishes are pretty simple. It's when your opponent whiffs an attack and 
then you punish during the recovery frames. Here's another example. Whiff. Punish. And here's another. Whiff. Punish. Yeah, I clearly wasn't ready for that. Then pokes are typically your faster single attacks that keep your opponent in check at certain ranges. Since they are typically faster and safer on block in comparison to, say, a launcher or combo starter, they allow you to stay more mobile since the frames are allowed to recover faster. This is where the emphasis on range becomes prominent with these type of attacks. For example, even though jabs are fast and safe, they are stubby and have a limited range. So if your opponent predicts your jab, they can punish you with a longer rage poke from a safer distance. When compared to a combo starter or a launcher, of course they don't deliver as much damage, but if you land multiple pokes throughout a round, it can lead to one last optimized decision. KO. Then you have the wild card, feints, aka baiting. These are situations where you make yourself seem vulnerable in order to make your opponent overcommit. In G Gundam, a character by the name of Domon Kashu has a special move called Erupting, burning which he typically does with his right hand. One match he uses said burning finger and seems to be defeated. Yes, the burning finger! I win! I won! No! I'm not done yet! But he intended to get his opponent to overcommit while setting up his left hand instead to close the distance for the final move. Smart! Big time smart! Spam a move over and over so when they finally bite the bait, they get burned instead. Movement creates most of these situations, whether it be you or your opponent, like setting up a whiff punish opportunity like a well placed back dash or a sidestep in Tekken's case. Then you have one of your pokes that finally land and you're able to move in to apply pressure, or even intentionally moving into your opponent's striking range to bait out a big move, only to punish that ass when they do. If you're primarily focused on whiff punishing, you can beat out someone using keep out tools if you're patient enough to wait for a whiff punish opportunity. If you're focused on keep out, players who constantly try to rush you down will find a hard time to get in due to your ranged attacks and keeping them in check. Then if you're someone focused on rush down due to the close proximity may not give them enough time to react on a whiff punish. Or just due to the flurry of attacks, you just might just, just fuck them up, I don't know. It's all considering your approach to the situation, which applies to more than just fighting games. In one of those games where the high consideration of your approach is important is an FPS. <laughs> Ooh, you sexy bitch. I know this isn't one to one, but just bear with me, okay? Whip punishes are when someone misses and you give them the good old blah blah and retaliation. Utilize the movement to avoid getting hit or get to cover as you're getting poked from a distance. Then you have to make decisions on how you approach your opponent, which is just as crucial. Do I hit confirm my opponent from a medium range, then close the distance to add pressure? Or did I do enough damage on the initial hit that only requires one more decision? Do I bait them with false movement to get them to overcommit? Or maybe I'm just being pressured and I can land a well placed poke, I mean shot, that can slow them down or make them reconsider their approach. Of course, unlike a fighting game, you have teammates who can also poke, building up to a collective final decision rather than an individual one. Unless you land that mother in headshot. Just like fighting games, it doesn't just consist of one element, but a lot of elements that are constantly rotating throughout a match. This is where things get fun in my opinion, because you have to consider all these situations yourself. It's not just a one-sided battle. Like I said at the beginning, footsies are practically the struggle of the flow of the match, as both sides use single decisions to inch their way forward until the final moment shows itself. Like Eagle Raptor once said, You wouldn't just rush in like nothing mattered, throwing your fucking life away. You would stop nervously and assess the situation before slowly and carefully approaching danger. You wouldn't play a MOBA and just run in like... You wouldn't play an FPS and just run in like... And you wouldn't play a side scroller and run in like, okay, you get it. Footsies, aka playing the neutral, is basically the consideration on how to approach your opponent without being careless with the four elements of hip hop. I mean, footsies. You thought I was only going to be referencing Tekken in this video, huh? Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> The reason why I wanted to tell you guys this now is because ranges to me were practically invisible. So when I encountered Korean backdashing for the first time, I literally didn't even know what buttons to press in these situations, showing my true Gurira Supreme nature. They would move into my range, I bite, I die. Simple as that. So I figured I should learn Korean backdashing to at least run away from these situations. In order to do a Korean backdash, you need to start it off with a backdash, which is back back. Then cancel it with down back. Let the lever go back to neutral briefly, then continue the back down back to neutral in order to continue the back dash. If that serves too difficult, you can do this one instead. Quarter circle back, quarter circle back for the same result, but it doesn't work with certain characters like Paul, Brian, or Nina because you'll get a back sway instead of a back dash, which leaves you vulnerable. If you happen to do this motion forward, it would allow you to do something that's called a wave dash, which is a forward dash cancel. Yeah, this is cool, but what's the point of all this? Well, the primary benefit being that it shortens the recovery 
time by canceling with another movement, which in this case we're using a crouch, allowing you to return to neutral much faster. Let's say it takes 8 frames to return back to neutral during a backdash. If you were to crouch during the animation, however, it can shorten it to almost half or less than that, allowing you to defend and move more often. Now to be clear, I don't know if a backdash is actually 8 frames, I just used that as an example to get the point across. Now add Korean backdashing to the footsie formula, you can make movement decisions more often while maintaining being just in or outside of someone's striking range. Now although this technique's movements are beneficial, understanding what pokes and combo starters to use at the ranges created by this motion is what makes it worth its salt. And it should be said that Tekken isn't the only fighting game that has a movement exploit. Dead or alive? I'm so fast, you couldn't even comprehend how fast I am. Super Smash Brothers. And Marvel vs. Capcom. They really don't know. I'm fast as fuck, boy. To name a few that all have dash canceling mechanics. Nonetheless, though, no matter what game you're backdash canceling in, they all share the same purpose. Create situations that a single backdash can't. Won't lie here, I struggle with this, but there was a trade-off I didn't see coming. I began to clean up my quarter circle motions thanks to this, and in combination with the cleaner way of doing it with the emphasis on the back to down back, cleaned up my dragon punch input. Now I had a path to kill two birds with one stone. Though I may not be ready to do Korean backdash, I was able to get familiar with motions that would allow me to play a character that I wanted to play since the beginning. So here we go, I'm getting my hands ready, getting time on my work schedule to train this, and now I'm getting all excited to do this, and, uh, but now do I really need to learn something like this? Are you or me, this Korean backdash stuff, this frame data shit, this, the, the spacing, the footsies, and all this other stuff, do I really need to learn any of this to enjoy fighting games? No. No, you don't. But let me explain. When you take the initiative to learn something like footsies, frame data, or advanced techniques like Korean backdashing is the moment where you discover if you really bout this shit. Let's use one of my first competitive games, Tony Hawk. Nope, not that one. Nope, go back. Nope, almost there. Okay, all right. Tony Hawk Underground, aka the only one that ever mattered. Let's say your highest score is about a million, which is enough to be competitive with your friends both online and off. Until you stumble across a lobby where they're hitting 10 times or almost 100 times your personal high. So naturally you ask, how the fuck? So you do some digging and find a technique simply known as the grind glitch, where if you double tap grind, it will reset the balance meter as if you started grinding for the first time. So when your bar becomes too sensitive, you can use this glitch in order to reset it to a far more controlling and forgiving state, allowing you to extend your combos just like these guys. Thing is, doing this glitch is only part of the pie. You need to learn how to optimize your entire line, like stage knowledge, alternate routes when things go wrong, when to commit, when not to commit, and much, much more. This is when you make the decision to stay with your 1 million high score friends or make the decision to learn these things to better yourself as a player. If you ever try to work an improvement or get good in any video game, you have experienced this in some way. You can simply stay at your current level as you're not trying to be the best who had ever played the game, but then you're faced with the option to learn these fundamentals that still may not make you the best player in the world, but will grant you the opportunity to be the best you can be. Two completely different games, two unintentional functions, with two free rides traveling down the same road with a fork in it. One heading to Scrub City, and the other to get good Bill. This is the beginning of something I like to call the journey. As a player begins to evaluate themselves to see where they want to stack up in the game of their choice. The journey's destination is only determined by the journey-er, along with the difficulty curve. It can be a challenging one like climbing a bracket to win a major or a local, whenever they come back, or something as simple as learning an input. The choice is yours. But the best part about all this is you can learn at your own pace. You can set up small side quests along your longer term journey to balance out the struggles towards your ultimate goal. Now I'm not saying you can't learn trial by error, hell, it's the way I learn, but familiarizing yourself a little bit with fundamentals can edge out opponent that lacks all of them and save you some pain, unlike me. So with this new way of trading my hand dexterity, I returned to Akuma to see if these dragon punches and quarter circle motions were a bit more consistent. Which, to my surprise, they were. Maybe not in a combo yet, but I could do them on their own. Then something unexpected happened. The more I began to go through Akuma's... I... I... I, I didn't like the way he felt in my hands. It's not you. Me. No, it, it was you. But the unfortunate outcome that Akuma was not my bae to be, I was kinda lost. That isn't saying I wasn't having fun playing Alyssa at the time, but I just had some goals in mind that I wouldn't be able to execute with her. Every so often though, change comes in bizarre ways, especially when it comes to finding a new main. Sometimes we play a character because of their backstory. Sometimes we choose a character because they reflect us in real life. But sometimes, you get bodied by some cool ass shit, and it makes you want to do that cool ass shit too. Chat. How dare you distract me. <laughs> Which is how I found my 2D substitute, Aliza. I'll fit on you nice and slow later. <laughs> Aliza 
Aliza was introduced into the Tekken community as a voted nominee for the free-to-play Tekken Revolution. Degenerates, all of you. However, Namco decided to shake things up by creating the first 2D character archetype for their 3D-based fighter, unlike other characters that originate from other titles. This means she has fireballs, dragon punches, a 2D jump arc, and her character-specific trait, dive kicks. Sorry, this may have been my degenerate phase. Nope, I lied, this was. Gary! Even though she had these 2D elements, she wasn't the perfect character. With extremely punishable lows, one of the few characters without a standing low, and a below average damage output without walls, put her towards the lower end of the tier list. Which in my humble opinion, fuck a tier list. Play a character that you vibe with heavy or just choose a character that you have interest in to get accustomed to the gameplay first in my opinion. That goes for top tier characters as well. If you like those characters, just play them. However, I can't control what people think about you if you choose to play said characters. Now that Elisa officially moved into my house of trash, it was time to grind. Elisa was easily my better character, lacking the execution requirement from Elisa, not to mention she had the get out of jail free car with the sidestep down for two that I got accustomed to so early. With the lack of knowledge of both characters, it was time to look outside of my own box and start going outside of it. So I began spectating matches of other players to get some insight on how these characters can be played. In most games, watching high level pro or just people who are better than you can help you trim down your plethora of options down to the essential ones instead of just throwing the whole book at someone. Since fighting games only have to worry about the one-on-one -on -one aspect, it will produce these same situations multiple times throughout a match. Unlike other games where you can't replicate a situation entirely from multiple variables like RNG, bad teammates, etc. In fighting games, you can go online, die, training mode, and then replicate that situation that made you unalived in the first place, while finding a solution. Then you can go a step beyond that, I mean change the guard options a bit, stand guarding, crouch guarding, random guarding, uh, record some movements for punishable opportunities in a string, or like just, just go wild. I mean the tools are there man, use them. Even though I know they can be fucking torture, but you know I'm just saying. Just like how you're questioning my sanity throughout this video, you should probably be questioning the decisions of a player that you're spectating. Like oh why did he go for a throw, oh he got him next to the wall. You could duck that string? or something as simple as taking notes of their movement compared to yours. Like ever watch a match and be like, This guy isn't even doing the optimal combos, what a script man. Oh, man. Only to find out he was actually keeping them out of rage. So I'm gonna be honest here for a quick second though. Watching players do shit can make you feel some type of way, am I right? Let's say uh, you randomly get into basketball and discover Michael Jordan for the first time. You're encouraged by the way he plays, his thought process, his execution, and even his famous dunk from the free throw line. Like it is now. He just went back and and did his thing. Seeing MJ or those at that skill level do the things you wish you could only dream of at the moment is where the real test lies because what will happen when you can't replicate their execution one to one? It is extremely easy to forget that you're watching somebody else's hard work pay off. It may look seamless now but there was a point in time where they had to take the same step that you're looking at right now. You will never know if you're a prodigy until you take that same step yourself. Anyway, even if you can't replicate the same execution, there is always something to be learned, which I learned this firsthand with a simple combo starter known as Down 3 into Dragon Punch. As a new initiate of the Dragon Punch gang gang, my execution seriously lacked consistency. Instead of running away from the execution of boundaries, I wanted to at least try this move, so I synced it, tried it, online it, lanced it, and then they blocked the Dragon Punch? With some critical examination, I found out that it only works on counter hit. But this made me wonder, is there any situation that didn't require a counter hit? So into the rabbit hole I went. Ah, back four and rising one don't need a counter hit property. What what about jab? Same properties as down three, nice. Oh shit, EXDP works too? But my execution was still trash. Instead of running away from this, I looked for a substitute and that substitute was quarter circle back one plus two. Wait, 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 what the hell is a clean hit? You could use certain moves at close proximity and be rewarded with a guaranteed follow up, which in this case, quarter circle back one plus two is guaranteed even if the opponent it is stand blocking, aka holding back rather than down back. All of this stemming from a simple combo starter. So the more footage I watched, the more things I began to add to my gameplay, the more it actually showed in my gameplay. As Alyssa's rank began to rise with Elisa's not too far behind. Thanks to my old Street Fighter experience, I knew it was only a matter of time before I would encounter players who would straight up outclass me. So I had a simple question on my mind. How good am I? Really?
Those of you in the fighting game community can already see the projection of this next topic. Before I knew it, I found myself at my first local tournament for the sole purpose of getting better. Not trying to win the whole thing funny enough, but simply to find the holes in my gameplay. Tournaments can range in sizes from this 20-ish person tournament to majors hosting about a thousand entrants like EVO known as the biggest fighting game tournament in the world. What makes fighting game tournaments different from the bigger world of esports is anyone can join the tournament, no matter the stakes. Where the highest level of esports use a more traditional franchise style with contracts, teams, venues, and Lord Jesus the payouts. Mom, can you give me some money, please? Stop fucking around! The plus side of fighting game tournaments is anyone can dip their toes in what could be a future of competitive fighting games for next to nothing. Then you have players like me who just want to find their weaknesses, or other players who just want to enjoy a day with like-minded people in one space. I went 1-2 and two at my first tournament. Since I wasn't expecting to win at all, I was pretty happy with the outcome, even though my match wasn't very spectacular. <laughs> But I must say, it's a pretty cool experience to have people doing the end. It is pretty hype. No matter the reason why you're here or there, soak it all in while you got the chance. Ask questions to those you play about your bad habits, decision making, or matchups, because unlike online, the feedback is instant. Now I'm not telling you to expect a one word answer that will fix everything, just be open minded to criticism because it will only help you in the end. If there is one thing I would say here, and I would want you to take away, it would be this. Unless you're there to be the best, a sponsored player, or have some financial investment or obligation, it's not that fucking serious. Once your hobby isn't enjoyable anymore, it won't be worth keeping around. With my new introduction into the fighting game community, I mean this one by the way, not this fucking toxic cesspool. But to be honest, what video game community doesn't have bad apples? Made me appreciate fighting game culture as a whole. You have streamers that encourage outsiders to play fighting games. What's up dudes, Max here. Got a pretty special announcement. You have commentators that make that moment stick in your head forever. The competitive players that make the casuals want to be the best. Look out, oh my god, that's gonna do it 3 0. To the tournament organizers that make these tournaments happen, and the casual spectators that come and support them. To educators that will aid you in your fighting game journey. Bob is a simple, direct, no nonsense character. To the creative creatives who look at fighting games in a new medium. But Tekken isn't the only game which has a movement exploit, basketball has it too. And lastly, and the most important one, you. By playing these games and sharing your experiences with even just your friend may spark an interest for them to try it themselves. You can extend your reach to online to rally new players or veterans like yourself, host homie tournaments, or make content that may drive interest in someone who may have lost it before. For me though, I had no idea where to start. Or so I thought, because it only took one tournament match to set things in motion. You see, something would happen in a match between Aliza and somebody, I, I don't remember who it was, which would solidify Aliza as the embodiment of everything I couldn't do. This match was crazy. The momentum shifting back and forth between two combatants. They would win a round and then they would lose a round and then trades and just back and forth. Slow-mos, it had it all. Unfortunately, the Lisa player would lose in the end. A valiant effort. A valiant effort indeed. But you see, the outcome of this match wasn't what was burned into my brain. No, no, no. You see, this scenario right here would play out as if I bought my ticket to be an audience member for the second time. Welcome back everyone, I am your host, Winsome Dimsum, streaming to you the Tekken Titan Tournament Top 8. Introducing our first two combatants, Final Crush with his intricate Aliza against Super Tokyo's Explosive Armor King. Final Crush is down two rounds, can he bring it back? We got word that our players are ready, so let's get this show on the road. Round start. Fight. Final Crush stresses off with a teabag. Three. Final Crush whiffs the magic four. Armor King overcommits. Two. Counter hit, but Final Crush botches the dive kick conversion. One. He misjudges the distance for the throw. And now we have... Lift off. Lift off. We have a lift off. 32... 
Now all he has to do is follow up with a back 2-3 into instant. later in another game with another character the game shark dive kick returned when taking the path of improvement our minds go in the direction of I know what I want and I want to get good now. Stop your singing this instant, young man. I will not have this in my studio. Or less memely put, we tend to rush to the advanced stuff before getting accustomed to the fundamentals or whatever we're trying. When we learn some advanced technique in the early stages, not all, but most tend to hyper-focus on using that said technique, almost forgetting there's still basic fundamentals of the game at hand that would actually prove much more effective in the long run. Like a quick time jump into MK11, there was a friend I had who was like, I'm gonna whoop that ass because I learned the highest damage combo in this fucking game, bro. Problem was, when I didn't fall to like no punk bitch, he decided to force it over and over and over again and then his movements became extremely predictable because he didn't understand the value of like a knockdown or simple punishes because he only focused on using that combo alone forgetting there's more basic things to Mortal Kombat. This would be the exact reason why I didn't go out of my way to learn this damn demon diving death strike which by the way is known as an instant air dive kick or a TK dive kick. TK standing for Sackett's tiger knee as it used to be the input method for this type of attack. I knew I would do absolutely everything to show off this brand new shiny tool in my gameplay and completely ignore everything else I actually needed to work on. I had finally came to the conclusion during my Street Fighter experience that this dive kick alone wasn't the reason why I lost. It was actually all the shitty decisions I made up until that point. This downward diving femur slam may have been the reason why I lost the battle, but my ignorance to understanding the environment around me was the reason why I lost the war. The two people I was watching in this tournament compared to the guy I ran into so long ago when their techniques, setups, punishes, or whatever didn't work, they would be able to revert back to their fundamentals until another opportunity showed itself. This made it clear that I, I had no fundamentals, I just did things. When my gameplay wouldn't work, I would just throw the move list hoping to pressure my opponent into making a mistake, which of course resulted in me making mistakes. I felt like I was buying all these tools, but didn't have an understanding when it came to using them. For example, I was learning things like Korean backdashing, but I had no understanding of how to dance in somebody's striking range. I would learn big giant combos with no clue on how to set up an opening for that exact situation. This is where the video begins to come full circle. As a way to get better at fighting games, I really needed to understand the game that I was playing. Thus only being a matter of time before I'd start learning about the topics that I explained to you guys in the beginning of the video. With EVO 2018 right around the corner, I told myself I will build on all of my weaknesses to the best of my abilities to try to use them at EVO 2019 that following year. Even though I was confident I can do this stupid Game Shark Femur Slam, I decided to ignore it for the time being, not to mention it would take up valuable time I had to work on things that really mattered. And just like that, my fighting game journey began. Since I would be here all day trying to recollect everything that happened during that year, I would just go over the key points that I encountered throughout that time. With the conclusion of EVO 2018, Season 2 for Tekken would be released with introduction of new and returning characters, but what really caught my interest was the changes to every character that would be coming to this season, known as Patch Notes. But when I looked into this shit for the first time, C number mumble jumbo had me like, the fuck is this shit, man? So I would have to put my boomer ass in the class of frame data. <laughs> Why did I pick this picture? I would learn this is better on block, that is worse on block, blah 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 blah, we went over this already. Finally having the patch notes in my hands, I finally analyze both characters. Alyssa had a lot of buffs to her chainsaw stance. Though welcome, the influence to use said stance was kind of strong, actually to the point where it kind of put me off, so she was kicked off the team. When it came to Elisa's patch notes, at least from the community, it seemed pretty positive, but for me personally, I still wasn't at the point where I could understand the advantages that came with the changes, but it did give me a drive to learn more, because when it did change down the road, I would be able to take advantage of them. Even though I vaguely understood the whole punishment thing, I now had numbers to help me consider the risk or reward scenarios. Now considering I wasn't trying to be the next ninja killer Sonic Takedo, I wasn't going to go through the frames of every single character. Though it would be beneficial, my brain just wouldn't be able to store all of it. To get myself familiar 
familiar with frame data, I would just watch my matches and look for the most common moves my opponents would do. Then go into training mode to see if I can punish it or not, and if I couldn't, I would try to look for a way to move around it. If I could punish it, I would punish it, as long as I remembered. Then finally, my spacing and movement was up next, as it only got marginally better. Remember when I said I would face somebody and I would just start hitting buttons if they stayed at a certain distance? Well, I finally learned how to take a chill pill. Instead of panicking, I would try to keep calm as best I could, find certain moves that I could keep them at a range, and then try my very best to wait for them to make a mistake. However, I am anti as fuck, and it definitely was a mixed bag of success. But success, it was. Something happening in the background that I didn't even realize is the move list that I was so scared of in the beginning had dramatically shrunk because I only chose the moves I found useful, never really using the entire move list, unless somebody had me figure it out. Then my Korean backdash had finally come along as well, becoming consistent with practice, giving me the confidence to run into my opponent's striking range to have them commit to a button to create a whip punish opportunity, or those boss ass moments where I'd be able to recognize using multiple backdashes instead of one. There couldn't possibly be anything I could do to improve my movement. Excuse me, I'm a bit of a stickler me seeks. What about your two player side? Now you would think with all this growth, I would have a win ratio would be able to represent my progress. Big nope. Matter of fact, this was the times I had the longest losing streaks. You would think I would get salty, blame the game for my losses, blame the characters, blame the system mechanics, but I found when you belittle the player or the system was the times I was deflecting my flaws at the most. Now everybody takes losses differently, so I can't really give you too much of advice there. But what I can say is try to take losses as an opportunity to learn from your mistakes or your opponent's mistakes so you can capitalize them when they come up again. Because I know, Sometimes you just be like, fuck this thing. Watch out, watch out. Unfortunately, too much of a good thing can grow tiring no matter what it is. Tekken 7 went from a rich chocolate ice cream to concrete vanilla. It was time to take a break. Even though I wanted to take a break, I wanted to keep my fighting game brain portion of my brain to be an exercise, and there wasn't any 3D fighters at the time that caught my interest. I figured a 2D fighter would fill the gap for a small period of time. That game would be a fast paced, team based. 2D fighter, oh excuse me, anime 2D fighter known as Blade Blue Cross Tag Battle. When I would play fighting games for the first time, I would just press buttons in a certain sequence and pray that I wouldn't die doing it. No plan, just run in and play the game I wanted. With my experience with Tekken 7, that thought process had completely disappeared because even though the representation between the two games were completely different, the general idea of how to engage and disengage were identical. I was looking for whip punish opportunities. I was making decisions based on spacing. I was considering spacing. When things were getting overwhelming, I would slow it down and wait for that one moment. Also, the mix-ups are fucking brutal in this game. Yes, this may seem obvious to you, but being somebody who never took the time to understand even one fighting game like I had Tekken was a welcome surprise. I know I had the confidence if Tekken for whatever reason wouldn't work out, the fundamentals I learned from it would be universal and I could transfer it from game to game. Finally, I could enjoy the genre in my own way, whether it be for the short term or the long term experience. Because a lot of people will tell you, you need to learn this, you need to learn that, in order to enjoy insert fighting game here. To be very clear, I am no pro, I am no high level player. I am no competitive player. Hell, I'm not even the greatest example of the things I gave you examples of. I'm simply a player who thought fighting games were far too hard for me to enjoy, only to find out that hard doesn't mean not fun. Now, even though I'm not the most dedicated or driven tournament player, doesn't mean I don't like to join my fair share of tournaments just to see where I stack up or just, you know, for the experience, for the dream that, you know, your boy might make it one day. With that said, I don't feel like I have enough experience in that realm of fighting games to give you guys proper advice and something to go on, so I figured I'd bring somebody in. That somebody being FeedyX, a competitive Tekken player from the Pacific Northwest, meaning the man, Noctis, to share his experience in competitive Tekken and give you guys some advice. I hope. <laughs> What's up, Alex? Thanks for having me. When I was learning, I was super into overthinking and obsessing over really tiny things that, looking back, didn't matter at all. I'd see someone block a low and think, damn, there must have been a clue here for them to know that a low was coming. And then I'd spend the next 30 minutes rewinding and counting every single low that came out, and I was like, insistent that there had to be a pattern or some kind of reasoning for the perfect low block to happen. Let's go! How's that, huh? Another one, damn it! 
And that stuff, though diligent and occasionally useful, is not the most efficient use of time. For me, I told myself that, you know, I had already grinded all the tech, I had all the fundamentals, I was just missing some kind of secret sauce that kept me from breaking into top 8, you know? So I scoured replays, and I would always just get frustrated because I'd see a pro miss a punish or miss an optimal combo, do some insane nonsense that would hit the opponent. And they would always come out on top of the tournament. Basically, they got crazy good results, and I just could not see why. It drove me insane. In my time both receiving and giving coaching, I found that generally this comes from misplaced priorities. Competition is amazing for driving growth, but focusing too much on the results is a huge pitfall. If the first thing you're thinking about is the loss or the tournament elimination or like the game throwing mistake, you're losing time and energy towards attention that could be spent improving across the board or finding everything that can be optimized. Here's a great example from a match I had with Joe Crush in ICFC. Joe can do this. Okay, nice not like that. Not like that, Joe. Not like that, Joe. Not like that. Joe. No. 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 I go on to lose the rest of the set after this. It's tempting to think, damn, all I had to do was not down jab there. But the set wasn't literally lost in that moment. So many mistakes happened before and after that. These mistakes might not have determined the set alone, but they're all points of improvement, and they matter a lot in the long run. Turning a blind eye to these things because, well, that's not why I lost, is what actually holds a diligent competitive player back. So while a bunch of us may take joy in laughing at scrub quotes here and there, there's the other end of the spectrum where we tunnel in on the results we get or the mistakes we make. And if you're not being constructive about it or if you're insistent on the results coming, it's a great way to plateau and get frustrated. Growth isn't linear and looking for some aha moment to try and bump your results like a little step higher can lead to a lot of frustration and stagnation. Don't take any of your skills for granted and don't assume you have something figured out. There's always a way you could just be a little better, but that's just my best guess anyways. I'm not a pro player yet. Hopefully I'll keep getting better and I'll have something better for you next time. Anyways, I was FeedyX. <laughs> I was FeedyX. Anyways, I'm FeedyX. You can catch me on YouTube and on Twitter at uh, FeedyX Games or on Twitch at FeedyX. Thanks again for having me. Get out there and practice backdashing because that's all I do. As a fortunate for me, bad for Tekken situation unfolded, time seemed to fast forward at an incredible pace. I mean, what do you expect when you see shit like this for a couple of months? Before I knew it, EVO was one month away. My execution was polished to the point where only the hard combos were considered difficult, and my movement had a sense of purpose finally. Neither of them flawless, but far better than where I started. After sharpening all the aspects I had planned on throughout the year, only thing left now was this damn dive kick. But you're probably wondering why this was such a big deal to me. I mean, it's not that hard. At this point, it's really just a combo extension and it's not going to make me any better. So what's the big deal? Simple, really. I just wanted to prove my past self wrong. This dive kick was a reminder of a time where I told myself this was a barrier to entry, a skill gate in some cases. Instead of embracing it, I just gave up. In Street Fighter 4 with Kami, I never really made any progress because I never tried to get better. I was contempt at where I was. Like having a job where you're not trying to overperform or underperform, as fate would have it though, I was exposed to somebody who showed the benefits of going outside of your comfort zone. I wanted to try it myself, only to fail and then quit. Since I hadn't put myself in a situation of struggle, it was easy to quit and go back to the contempt mind state. Thanks to those passes and fails throughout the year, I understood that this dive kick was no different from any other challenge I came across, outside my previous endeavors of course. Even if I were to do this move or some advanced technique after, getting good never ends. Because once you feel like you optimize one thing, something else will always come up to be sharpened, only leaving you the decision to say you're finished. Now that all of my challenges were finally finished, there was only one more left. So would this be another roadblock or would this be something in my past? Elisa.
Ooh, fuck this move. I would then go to evil and come out with a record of three and two. Of course, not the highest ranking of all time, but you know, I was satisfied with the turnout. Even though I may have reverted back to some bad habits. I wish I would have had it on video, but um, somebody forgot to record the screen. What were you recording? Unlike my first evo where I soaked the experience solo, I somehow got my friends interested enough in fighting games in a short amount of time, maybe like two months or three months to make the trip out to evo. They entered their own tournament, giving us a well-rounded view of the fighting games they had to offer, like Smash. Smash, Mortal Kombat, and Tekken. Whether their journeys in the genre was sparked from here would remain to be unknown, but the experience alone was one to remember, including the awfully painful morning after. Going all the way back to Street Fighter 2 in the arcades, to Tekken 1 on the PS1, to Capcom vs SNK 2 on the PlayStation 2, and then finally to Street Fighter 4 on the Xbox 360. This genre of kick, punch, it's all in the mind has been in my rotation of games for the last 29 years, but it took me 27 of those years to finally give these Punch Planet Bandits a real chance. With my progress of Tekken 7 made me curious of the obvious. What would have happened if I didn't quit all those games in my past? Where would I be today? Who knows? But now I'm able to enjoy the genre that I once deemed to be too hard. Setup? Can we do the setup? Oh! <laughs> Oh, is that it? Is that it? Is that how we end this shit? <laughs> that was sick. I had conquered my demons finally. I had gained the ability to approach fighting games in a way for me to enjoy them for the short term or the long term without considering difficulty. The previously ditched games from my past now had a second win. I even went back to Street Fighter 4 to confirm I can do this instant die pick in that game and making sure it wasn't like a Tekken thing that I was able to do it this time around. Funny enough, the TK motion is now something I look for in every character I play in a fighting game nowadays because it's so satisfying to do and you know have this story behind it now. It's actually pretty much a meme in my streams and now those of you who are in my streams know why I look for it. In this video, I shared my failings, my passings, my struggles, my pitfalls, and everything in between to make some of you understand that you're not alone in the world of trying to tackle something that seems impossible. There's no shame, no drawbacks, no hard feelings if you decide to leave. Every genre is not for everyone, and this genre might not be for you. We all understand if you can't stick it out. But if for some reason you do pick up a fighting game and decide to stick it out, well, here's some fucking words for you. Fighting games will give up on you unless you give up on them. This genre and the community that surrounds it does everything they can to ensure you enjoy your experience. From every single guide to every single character on YouTube, for the sole purpose for you to enjoy the game the same way we do. From movement guides to break bad habits to low parries to when to block and when to punish, the FGC is here for you. We want you to come out to your first tournament and enjoy your first experience there. To ignite the fire for fighting games that you didn't even know you had. The fighting game genre as a whole provides an opportunity for you to set that goal and go achieve that goal goal as an individual. No teammates, no RNG bullshit, not another Bangalore olds. Your first win. No, no, fuck that. All your wins will represent the progress of you becoming an even better fighting game player. Then when you run into a wall, train and hip chat that motherfucking wall. Then stand on that wall and tell them it hits like a bitch. Because you could start off your journey thinking you can't do this shit, only to find hours later saying I can do this shit. From landing your first fucking combo to hitting your first fucking electric to hitting your first fucking dragon punch to pairing your boys lows to getting your delicious punish to getting hype ass counter hits fighting games won't give up on you unless you do but if you happen to try a fighting game and get stuck like the rest of us just remember fighting games don't have the ability to give up on you they will always be waiting for you to come back no matter what so what i have to say is don't give up on fighting games because fighting games won't give up on you ridiculous and i think it's <laughs> yeah. and i think it's important like never to take yourself too seriously and we're, we're making we're yeah, making videos yeah. about video games you know it's video have games, fun yeah. with it absolutely it's 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 a line right how how much fun are you willing to have with it um alex nostalgics he does you know those videos on levers and stuff that yeah you can tell he's just having so much fun with the the videos and i think that's
If you made it this far, I really appreciate you watching the video. Thank you for just giving me the time of day for me to explain this stupid ass story of fighting games and hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, let me know in the comments down below on how your fighting game journey began. And yeah, thanks again for watching.